This is a regular session of Gilroy Unified School District's Board of Education meeting. Hay alguien aquí que necesite intérprete para la junta? No hay nadie. This meeting is being recorded or broadcasted. Images and sounds may be captured of those attending the meeting. 3A, Pledge of Allegiance. Trustee Nelson, would you please lead us in the Pledge of Allegiance? I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. And item 3B, approval of the agenda. Trustee Nelson. Yeah, I'd like to pull item 5C, please. Are you um, from requesting consent? approval of the agenda with the removal uh, with, or with the set aside of 5C? Correct. Thank you. Okay. Do I have a second? Second. Okay. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Okay. Motion carries. General public comment. Well, now, now we go into 5C. I was going to do 5C. Yeah. Sorry when about that. Five when we go to the consent. You're right. Okay. <laughs> We're just testing you. <laughs> Good. <laughs> General public comment. We have no general public comment. Report of action taken in closed session. Email. I got the email. <laughs> Thank you. Item 2A, public employee discipline and dismissal release. The board voted to terminate the employment of four classified employees. The motion passed six to one with trustees Aguirre, Fiac, Good, Nelson, Pace, and Pisano voting yes, and Trustee Diaz voting no. Item in closed session 2C, readmission of students to schools. The board voted to approve the readmission of student case 2022-19. The motion passed unanimously with trustees Aguirre, Diaz, Fiac, Good, Nelson, Pace, and Pisano all voting yes. Item 2E, conference with legal counsel, existing litigation. The board approved a settlement agreement to resolve a student's educational claims. The action passed unanimously with trustees Aguirre, Diaz, Fiac, Good, Nelson, Pace, and Pisano all voting yes. And now we have some expulsions. And that one. Uh, item a uh, case, I'm sorry, case 2022-42. Move to expel. Second. Uh, I, sorry. I believe that's an acceptance. Move to accept the stipulated expulsion. <laughs> nice. Nice. Do we have a second? I will second that. Thank you. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion carries. Expulsion case 2022-43. Move to expel. Ms. Michelle, second. Thank you. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. 2022-52. Move to, to go ahead. Move to expel. Second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? I would further like to move to suspend the expulsion. I'll second that. Thank you. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion carries. Case 2022-53. Move to expel. Do I have a second? Ms. Michelle, second. Thank you. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? I move to suspend the expulsion. I'll second that. Thank you. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Thank you. Motion carries to suspend. Case 2022-54. Move to expel. I'll second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion carries. Thank you very much. And now we have item four, superintendent's report. Thank you. Um, we haven't met, well, we had a special meeting in July, but we haven't met since our regular meeting in June. So I'm gonna go back to June and uh, say a few things about what happened in June. So after our last board meeting, there were a number of special events that I attended. 
Jane Howard, who's uh, been involved with the city, with downtown, and with our Welcome Center for many years, and just does an incredible, did a incredible, in fact, she's still working. They extended her contract <laughs> since her retirement. But anyway, um, she had a retirement celebration out at um, Joy Gardens. We had two events back to back, sorry. So we first went to Jane's uh, retirement at Gilroy Gardens. It was a wonderful event, great uh, celebration, many, many people there. I felt like I knew almost everybody. It was amazing. And they were from lots of different organizations. But Jane's amazing. And we hate to see her retire, but understand why she's doing it. Um, and then we went up the road a little bit to the Cal Soap alumni, alumni event. Uh, during which Diane Padilla was honored and received the Edwin Diaz Educator of the Year Award. And uh, we had we weren't there that long, but it was clearly a wonderful event. I know they do some fundraising and there were a lot of people at that event also. So we really enjoyed, when I say we, it was Melanie, Natalie, and me <laughs> going to these two events that night. Um, and then a couple of days later, I went to Kathleen Rose's uh, retirement celebration uh, on the same stretch at another winery. And uh, again, it was really a very nice, uh, intimate celebration. And I was glad that I could be there because Kathleen and I've worked closely for quite a while now, even before she was president. On June 28th, a number of us witnessed the first uh, demolition at South Valley Middle School. It was quite uh, an event to stand, uh, not so much for Michelle, sorry, and maybe, <laughs> I know uh, the first building was yours that they took first down? Classroom. First classroom they took down was hers. Can you believe that? But anyway. You, you, you think that was just random? <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure it was, but anyway, uh, over the next couple weeks, it was amazing how fast things came down, and now that uh, area is completely graded it, it, it's a completely different place. It's pretty, pretty amazing. And a number of you came on the walkthrough on Friday and got to see the new classrooms and the area that's, you know, been cleared. It's pretty amazing. Um, of course, we had summer school. We had a great summer school. And as I always do, I visited the sites. So on June 29th, I went to Brownell where we had our high school summer school program. It was going very well. We had a lot of teachers this year compared to last year. So it was great. I guess we didn't even hire all the people that applied. So that's pretty remarkable. And then on July 5th, I went to Rod Kelly. Actually, I only made it to Elliot that day. No, I made it to Rod Kelly and Elliot that day, not on the uh, following event, the showcase. But uh, yes, I went to Rod Kelly and Elliot, and it was really amazing what's happening. That's mostly our power school and special ed programs at those two sites. And on July 7th, I went to Solar Sano, Again, power school and special ed at the middle school level. All the programs are running, running very well. Greg Camacho Light was our summer school principal. And of course, Mandy Reedy had a major involvement uh, in the power school program. We met um, with the mayor and the city administrator on July 22nd. And I have to say our meetings have gone really well this year. I feel like they're really meaningful discussions. We're talking about interest, uh, common interest and common issues. And it's been really helpful. And I think as a result of our relationship building in these meetings, we've had a lot more dialogue even outside the meetings than we've had in a while. So it was very nice. July 25th, we had our Power School Summer Showcase. There's a result of our meetings. The mayor came, I think, for the first time to our our showcase. So that was great. And we had two districts come. That's one of the reasons for our power school showcase is to sh show it off and for other programs that are interested in creating programs like ours. So we had representatives from Sunnyville and Morgan Hill there and the mayor and a few other uh, people. On uh, last Monday and Tuesday, as you know, I have a management retreat every year. And we had a guest speaker on Monday morning for four hours, Dr. Hood, Joelle Hood from Think University. And I have never received so much positive feedback from management staff. It was a very interactive morning, very positive uh, message that she shared with us. And I think it just was great to start the year that way. And then they got to hear from all of us. <laughs> I'm sure they loved ours too, right? 
Um, and then um, August 3rd, we had our summer school graduation at Brownell, my famous hat, which Melanie and I were laughing about uh, today. I look like a, I don't know what, but anyway, I need a new hat. Um, it was like 95 degrees, of course, at Brownell out there on the quad, the artificial turf, which as you know, gets 10 degrees warmer than the temperature. So it felt like an oven, <laughs> it was so hot. But I think most of the grads came and it was a really nice ceremony, short, thankfully, but a very nice ceremony. I'm always really touched by adult ed and summer school because those students have really faced some serious adversities and still have overcome those and received their high school diploma. Last uh, Thursday was Gekka's first day of school. As you know, they start a couple weeks, well, not quite two weeks before the rest of us. And that they have a two week intercession before Gavilan starts. We have to do it this way because of the required number of days in the school year. And actually, Sonia and I were talking about it's really good that they have the two weeks, especially for the incoming freshmen to sort of build school climate, acclimate them to all the things they're going to be doing, including more in person classes this year at the college. So it's a really, it's a really good time. And they get into their classes. Of course, first day they were doing a lot of team building, getting to know you, what'd you do this summer kind of stuff. But they also got their schedules and they were starting to gear up for a really rigorous program. On Saturday, I went to the Ohana Health Fair at Glenview, which I didn't even understand what I was going to until I got there. But it, I actually was really impressed. It was all the major agencies in our county and some people came from out of the county. There were people here from Fresno. Uh, it had to do with, you know, a certain kind of program where you order your groceries at home. I forgot the name of it, but it's really climate friendly program. But a lot of it was about health services, mental services, social services. It was impressive. And the hour I was there, there were only about four or five people from the neighborhood that came over, but apparently, uh, Marie told me later more people were there because she spoke to them when she was there later. I, I was thinking, wow, I'd like to duplicate this several times in the district at different locations. But the amount of resources was just incredible. Uh, the number of people that came to that. And then yesterday, one of my favorite events every year is the new teacher orientation. We had about 70 new teachers. And it, I talked to about half of them. I didn't get through all of them this year. Um, but they, I think we've hired a great group of new teachers, very diverse group from, you know, I met several people that this is their first teaching job and they look like they're in middle school. <laughs> and then people that have taught 20 years, that one woman I talked to, I think she's at Luigi, um, has taught 20 years in a district in the north and just finally said, I'm sick of the traffic, I want to teach in my own city. So quite a, quite a range of uh, experience, but a lot of enthusiasm. So really looking forward to seeing all of them out at their school sites over the next few weeks. And of course, we start school next Wednesday. And we are very excited because it's going to be, I don't want to use the word normal because I've gotten where I don't even like that word anymore. But it's going to be very close to the way it was before the pandemic. How's that? Um, because we don't have all the safety protocols, we can do things in groups, we can be outdoors at a large events like Monday with certain protocols, of course, that will be in place. But we're really looking forward to a year much like what we used to experience. And that concludes my report. Thank you. I have a question. Usually we have a student report right before yours. When will we uh, anticipate having our student report? We just talked about that. I can't get an orientation meeting until end okay. of August, so it'll okay. be September. Okay. Yeah, last year, I don't know how I did it. I think it was like super rushed, but we talked about the second meeting of September. Yeah. Okay. Right. The, that last year, they started on the first meeting in September. That's because I had a meeting on August 24th, I think, the orientation meeting. but. Got a lot on my calendar. Really? Yes. Okay, thank you. All right, now we have consent agenda item 5C, which is resolution number 22-2301 annual list of approved and prohibited fundraisers for the 2022-23 fiscal year. Uh, Trustee Nelson, you have some questions. 
Uh, yes. Um, I was reading the resolution that says all organizations that conduct fundraising activities must be approved by the board, but there's something about um, the home and school clubs and PTAs and booster clubs are not part of that. Can you explain what, what the difference is and what accountability is there for um, the home and school clubs, PTAs and booster clubs? Is there any overlap? between ASB, which is under district control, and the other funds? Yes, th thank you, Trustee uh, Nelson. And my apologies if I missed a question um, that you emailed before uh, on this topic. Um, ASB, as you mentioned, is Associated Student Body. Um, they're supported by internal district staff, so they have an ASB clerk. They're also supported at a district office level from a high-level fiscal controller. And then ultimately, they're supported all the way up to me. Uh, with district office and including our auditors. So they're part of our financial statements. So when uh, James, Martha and company or auditors come, those um, activities are included in the audit. Uh, so they're just like our funds. They're reported as funds, they're audited like our funds, et cetera. That's ASB. Uh, booster clubs, uh, PTAs, all those are external organizations that I don't have visibility into their financial books. Therefore, I can dictate exactly how they deposit how they all those transactions that i would normally have direct oversight over and responsibility over i only have fiduciary responsibilities which means they can fundraise using um you know inflatables and all those uh, activities that are uh, prohibited in accordance with board policy that's a big separation of of of, of, of a line that that we need to have so that's i think globally the the big difference is ASB is our own internal funds. We have staff that support those activities. We have direct oversight and responsibility over those activities. They're included in the financials of our district, whereas PTAs, booster clubs, are external entities. They fundraise on our behalf, um, but, but I don't have visibility into their books. Okay, follow-up question. Um, in the uh, summary abstract, it says, it is recommended that the board approve guidelines for these groups to follow? Because they are established to provide support to the district, do we have guidelines for? Yeah, generally speaking, they're uh, the guidelines that the fiscal crisis and management team uh, puts out. It's a hefty book. Um, I can share that. Uh, but they're guidelines for school connected organizations as well as a hefty guidelines for ASB um, organizations. But as far as the resolution is concerned, um, so the third section down where it says all. So it excludes the home and school clubs, PTAs, and booster clubs? I believe all organizations that conduct fundraising activities to benefit students, schools, or the district as a whole must be approved by the school governing board. So that encompasses all, all. all organizations. Yes. Activities. yes. We don't monitor no. budgets, okay. expenditures. Yeah. We don't audit. Say there's an Elliott Parent Club. Yes, we're good. They want to have a fundraising event. We've talked to principals about this. So I've heard Alvaro say this to the principals. They need to have that fundraising event. They need to send it to him and we need to know about it. But the other side of that, which is where your main question is, is that we don't audit or control mm -hmm. their funds like we do. We audit ASB funds. I guess this third, whereas say for whatever reason, a parent club is going rogue, the district does have disapproval privileges and that we could prevent them from accessing. Mm -hmm. Yes. Thank you, trustee Pace. We can revoke their ability to fundraise on our behalf if, yes. if, if we find something um, that we're concerned about. And the way it normally works, if there's any concern about say a home and school club, we've both had this experience in our career and those co concerns come to us, we do then get involved. Okay. We've had two schools back in the dark ages and get reunified where the uh, parent clubs um, had some problems yes. and some misappropriation of funds. And that went to Gilroy PD because the district is not responsible for that. Mm -hmm. And I'm guessing, correct me if I'm wrong, Alvaro, but a lot of the um, restrictions on certain types of um, fundraisers, i.e. 
dunk tanks yes. <laughs> are, also, are because of our insurance. Yeah, they're also prohibited. And, and really the link, the financial link through all this, no matter what they call themselves, is the use of our tax ID. Um, right. ASB uses our tax ID, therefore I can get my hands on it. Um, PTOs, boosters, they, they have their own. They're their separate entity. Okay, thanks. Okay. And typically carry the other, their own insurance. Yeah, yeah they have yes, to. They have the to other way insurance. that we get involved is if they're using our facilities and there's a problem because they do have to go through facility trying to use our facilities. So that's another connection. Thank yes. Do, do we have a designated employee that can approve the activities as reflected in this resolution? I nominate that guy. <laughs> no, do we, do we have one? It would be Alvaro. Do we need to? Has he been designated, or I don't know. I understood to be the designated. <laughs> <laughs> well, but it says it says uh, must be approved by the school district's governing board or the board's designated employee. So that suggests to me the board would have to designate someone. And if we haven't done that, there is none. But it probably falls under a lot of the other things that the superintendent is designated by us that she can. It's an assumption. That's an assumption. I don't know if that's the case yes, or we not. Could I mean, maybe our auditors know if that's the best practice to call it out on a board agenda in the future. Sure, sure, we can. Or can do, that. It, um, hmm. do we want to amend this resolution, Trustee Good? Well, that's what I was thinking. Oh, that's even better. Yeah, or the governing board, or the uh, assistant the, superintendent. The, the, the superintendent. Let's give it to Debbie, who can. Yeah, or, who can then or designate. Choose. Superintendent or designee. Or superintendent's designee. Superintendent's That's designee. Good. However it is in all the board policies, right? Yes. That's so so in the so I would move, unless there's any other discussion, I would move approval changing uh, the last part of the third whereas where it says, or the board's designated employee. I would say uh, by the governing board or the superintendent or superintendent's designee. So in randomly open to one of the board policies it says the superintendent or designee it seems to be the, the wording that they yeah. want. Yeah. So that would be my motion with that change. Got that. Thank you. Do I have a second? Okay, so this is a resolution, so it's a roll call vote. Melissa Gary? Yes. 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 Thank you. Motion carries. Thank you. Move to approve item five except for C. Second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Okay, motion carries. Thank you. I was just going to go on to six. Forgot about the rest of them. Okay, item 6A adopt the GUSD 2023 24 budget development calendar. Mr. Mesa. Good evening once again, board uh, and board president, superintendent, and members of the public. Uh, tonight, although it seems extremely early, it is usual for me to be up here um, presenting to you the 23-24 uh, budget development calendar. It is so that we can establish really a tentative dates that in which the public can anticipate uh, various relevant discussion topics um, that are relevant for the budget development process of 23-24 fiscal year. Uh, so tonight, as you can see, uh, August 11th, we will be um, shortly uh, discussing the 45-day budget revision, but it does have a LCAP survey, LCAP budget um, scheduled for October 20th. That survey will now incorporate the discussions around transportation because that's a new um, requirement uh, for us to bring you an annual transportation plan. That's something that the governor um, put uh, in the enacted budget by April 1. So there's various elements that are important to the public, to our schools, to our employees. And so the budget development calendar is really just a roadmap. The board can choose to add, subtract, you know, relevant topics. Uh, we can have a special study session if the board wishes. This is just the anticipated regular board meeting schedules. Uh, nothing prevents the board from adding a study session at any given point on any, any topic whatsoever. This is just our usual roadmap so that the public can anticipate you know, relevant discussions around LCAP, uh, budget priorities, uh, May revision, et cetera. Trustees, do you have questions, comments? Okay, 
hearing none, I'll entertain a motion to accept. I will adopt, sorry. Go ahead. Uh, Ms. Michelle, move approval. Do I have a second? This is James, I will second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Okay, 6B, approve the 45 day revision of the GUSD 2022-23, that would be this year, budget. Thank you, Madam President. Once again, good evening. Um, so tonight uh, we are, I'll, I'll review the 45 day budget revision. Uh, it is based on the California enacted budget. So exactly what that means uh, and why we do um, our, a 45 day budget, you know, what's required. Um, I'll touch upon that. Uh, of course, I'll cover the highlights of the enacted budget. And in one slide, I promise to highlight the financial impact to our district, as well as an updated multi-year projection. Here's a slide that tells us in the public why we need to do a 45-day uh, budget revision. After all, the board did approve on uh, June 16th our adopted budget for this current year. And the budget is as fluid as personnel is. So it did change uh, with the enacted budget um, that the governor signed on June 30th. So that means we have up to uh, Sunday, August 14th, um, to present to the public, you know, uh, um, a summary of the revenue and expenditure changes that are a result of the Budget Act. So that's really what we're doing today. We're fulfilling the requirements of the Ed Code um, because the Budget Act did significantly change from the May revision. So this one slide was prepared by school services, really high level uh, differences here. And so what I did here was simply note that these boxed areas in red, the say GUSD budget revision, would automatically on their own right trigger a budget revision of 45 days because they're so significantly different than the May revision. So number one, the base LCFF local control uh, funding formula increase significantly from 6.1 to, to a, almost $9 billion. The key adjustment there was the uh, augmentation to the base of LCFF on top of the 6.56% COLA to I think it was over 6.2% uh, increase to the base. And it also allows us to use either the current year for average daily attendance funding, the prior year, or now a three-year moving average. I'm not moving average, a three-year prior average of attendance. So that's really a change on its own right that would have triggered um, a 45-day budget revision. But the other two also are significant as well. We were anticipating a discretionary block grant funding you know, the, the, the May revise had talked about it, but we did not include it in our budget. Um, and that's a good thing because it, it came out to a lot more revenue in total. Um, the discretionary block grant translated and really evolved into the arts and music block grant. I'll cover that in a minute. And then also this new almost $8 billion statewide learning recovery emergency block grant. It's one time, it's a massive investment. But all these three things uh, require us to do a budget revision, mainly to recognize the added revenues. Now, they're both ongoing and one-time revenues here. So this is just a really depiction of the amount of new spending uh, uh, that the state is having split up between you know, K-12 to the left and community colleges to the right. So I'll focus really on the spending and investments on this side, uh, easily over $30 billion most of it is one time in nature. It's about a 60-40 split, 60% you know, being one time uh, and 40% being ongoing. And this is just tells you the amount of investments that, 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 that we're making in, in public education is excellent. But of course, we have to ask ourselves, is all this sustainable? There's already um, uh, signs that the economy uh, is in a recession, of course, the first two consecutive quarters of uh, 2022. Uh, the first quarter was negative 1.6, the second quarter at negative almost 1%. Uh, the yield curve, you know, geeks, economic geeks, look at the yield curve on the two and 10 year yield, yield and if they're inverted, meaning that the, the two year is on top of the 10 year uh, treasury, uh, that, that means there's an inver inversion of the yield curve. That means you're paying higher on the two year than you are on the 10. That's a bad sign. And that's a really bad sign for economists because it's 98% chance 
that in two years we'll have a recession and then 66 percent chance that it'll happen in the first year so those are real signs in the economy that we pay attention to um, and i only mentioned that in the context of just the extraordinary amount of billions of dollars that are being pumped into the budget this year so much that governor brown uh, quite frankly said i don't know if this is sustainable as, as a comment to the current budget. Mm -hmm. For the first time since 2010 or 11, uh, these programs with a little check mark, like transportation, is obtaining any cost of living increases. They were effectively frozen in time for over 10 years ago. And so just to give you a real rough figure, if I add up all the COLA of all the, 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 the programs, all these four programs that have a little check mark that we have. So transportation, child nutrition, mandated block grant, adult ed, it adds to like 400,000. So even though it seems like a large amount, it, the COLA on these programs should be around 400,000. Now it's 400,000 that we didn't have before, so that's great, but it, it's, it's, it's not fully funding transportation at all. Um, this is just a graphic one time versus ongoing this is what i was referring to here it's just slightly um, approximately 60 percent of the investments are one time that's really important for us to see it's also important for us to know that the state can pull back 60 percent of those new investments right the following year they're not there so if the economy does in fact go into a heavy recession or if the revenues that the department of finance has forecasted like the lao has mentioned it's 70% chance, according to the LAO, that the revenues of the Department of Finance have built this budget on fall short of their expectations. 70% chance. So that's a, that's a third thing, right? That's a commentary from the legislative analyst office saying, I think your numbers are 70% chance that, that you're going to be off. And off to the tune of what? And their comment was $5 billion, which is not a small amount. Um, and getting into like the major layers of the investments, there's, there's no bigger layer than this learning recovery emergency block grant if you just take away the LCFF um, base. It's $8 billion almost in one-time funds. Luckily, we have until 27, 28 to spend this, so it's just about eight, uh, six years to spend these funds. Purpose, to target the learning gaps that COVID cost, whether short-term, long-term, whatever. Um, we got to close the achievement gap. I know that uh, you've heard from our superintendent, we've got to do better on the graduation rates, dropout rates, et cetera. This is um, one-time funds to help address all those key initiatives that we want to maintain. Again, there's long-term effects of COVID, short-term, that revenue can help us with. Um, the governor champions himself as an early education advocate, I guess. Um, and this is the, the bottom line, the increase to LCFF because of the new TK grade level. Now, it, of course, is implemented, implemented over four or five year period, but the add-on is 2,800 per student per year, right? So think of it this way, if all 24 students in that TK class show up 100% of the time for every single time, so they don't miss a day in class, we would have almost, and I mean almost, cover the average cost of a paraeducator in that class. Almost. Now, that's if they get 100% ADA, which will not happen, of course. So, it, yes, it, it's, it's getting at funding that second adult in the classroom, but it's not this windfall for education. It's the bottom line there. Um, there are some TK staffing requirements. Um, that's it, the 12 to 1. It's written into the Ed Code. There's some credentialing uh, certifications that I'm sure Dr. Winslow knows by heart. They're just for reference there. And getting to transportation, uh, transportation is roughly a $2 million program. We get $1 million from the state. So the state is saying, we will fund you the cost of living increase or 60% of your total trans transportation cost. The greater of those two things is 60% of the total transportation cost, roughly be about $200,000 for us. That, again, it's not fully funding uh, transportation. Yet they still want us to develop a plan that targets um, transportation or at least prioritizing the ability to transport uh, TK6 students and low income students. I want to be clear, it is not a requirement. It is not a requirement. The requirement is to develop a plan 
probably a dream if we were fully funded how could we achieve all this right so it would take a lot of staff probably tripling or quadrupling the staff that we have buses that we don't have money that we don't have uh to to be able to do all those things but that's a plan that we'll be developing i'll work with a, a supervisor of transportation to figure out how do we do this now i do want to make sure that the board and the public does know we do already do this we already uh provide transportation to students with disabilities and homeless we do provide that um, transportation to homeless youth so that we're already doing is the other elements um, that we have to address in the plan that we don't do and school districts don't do because we're not funded at that level yet but that, that plan will again come um, by april 1st so um, in march we'll come to you with a draft plan uh, before you you're asked to approve it mr mesa uh, yes. Me. Why? <laughs> We're not even fully funded now. So why is the state? I don't understand why the state is requiring us to um, come up with a dream plan. It, this is just my guess. Uh, excellent question, uh, board president. It's just to get a sense of the price tag, if you will. They have no idea the amount of need, even though there's six million students out there throughout California. The, the, uh, my sense is they're just trying to get a, a, a better feel for, they know the actual cost of transportation, but I think they're trying to gauge the demand to figure out how, how large are we, how far are we? I don't know that they know that 60% is going to be so far off. So this is due in April? Yes, the so plan that in, So that in May they can say, oh, that costs too much and no, we can't do that? Possibly, possibly. It's another unfunded mandate, um, as it's been the case for years. But thank you. Dr. And Sanders. the other point is we're short 10 bus drivers now. Yes. Never mind, ask us to transport more students, and that's statewide. Excellent point, Superintendent, because it, it, I'm afraid that this creates a false expectation from our parents that even if they get funded at 60, 70, 80 percent, um, there's a shortage of bus drivers throughout the state, um, and it, it's going to be challenging. A superintendent said we have 10 vacancies right now in transportation, and that's before we add on all these other possible requirements or increase the number of students that we transport. Um, this is the one slide I promised you, financial impact in just one slide, so if you don't care to you know, all 17 slides, this is the one slide you should carry. Um, so as long as the numbers, you know that these are estimates, the numbers will change. Please know that these are just our best estimates. Um, within this 45 day window, the legislature writes trailer bills, CDE hasn't even opened our ability to enter these exact numbers into our financial system because we have what's called a SACS code. Those sex codes aren't even open yet for me to enter this into our financial system. So all these are estimates that I enter into my multi-year projection, but they're not actually into the financial system because the California Department of Finance of Education hasn't even had the ability to allow us to enter those. That's how preliminary these numbers are, but there are good preliminary estimates. So number one, um, ongoing uh, LCFF funding, that's the add-on on top of the cost of living increase, which the cost of living increase for this year is 6.56. That statutory COLA did not change. What the state did there with adding an additional 6.28% is knowing uh, and acknowledging that the CalSTRS, CalPERS of uh, pension obligations were a stress to school districts. I think we have many partner uh, advocates speaking to the legislature on that. They listened. We also know that um, the COVID year was a terrible year for attendance because we all did the right thing. We stayed home when we weren't feeling well, so did our students, so did our parents, et cetera. Um, and that, um, even though they approved the three-year average, well, our average now includes the 90% ADA on top of a 95 and et cetera. So that was the reason why that increase to the base happened. Uh, but nonetheless, it's $6.5 million that I get to increase in the multi-year projection that wasn't there in June. The expanded learning opportunities program, I wanna be clear the total, I don't wanna freak out um, Mandy, a program administrator for this. The total is still 5.5 .5 million. 
what's on the slide here is the increase. We're already effectively getting $2.1 million. I just rounded up. Um, but the, the net increase is what I'm showing there on the slide. All this is about a change to revenues, change in expenses. So this is a change in revenues. Is still a $5, $5 million program. The Delta is 3.4. So those are the ongoing elements. They add up to $10 million. One is restricted. That's the expanded learning opportunities program. You'll, you'll see that clearly in the multi-year projection. I'll highlight it for you. Um, but this is the ongoing um, revenue sources. On the one time, most you can see have a little asterisk. That means that they're, you know, strings attached to those dollars. So they're effectively categorical programs. So that means we can't just use them for general purpose. Except that I wanted to highlight that the three year average of um, uh, average daily attendance adjustment, that I consider one time. And here's why it, we were funded on the 1920 average daily attendance for three consecutive years because of COVID and Hold Harmless. In those two years, we declined over 511 students, yet we didn't feel, um, feel the drop in revenues because of that Hold Harmless protections. When you average those two years that we were effectively frozen at 1920, and then you add that third year, which was last year, that terrible year of 90% ADA, well, you get a, a built-in protection that's outweighted for something that will never happen again. You'll never happen to have a, a, a COVID year, hopefully never again in 100 years, but it doubled the protection. And that's the point here is this is outweighing that protection twice. So when I run my multi-year, we get a blip of 3.5 million in revenue for students we no longer have that drops to 1.4 the following year and is nearly gone to the tune of 700,000 only max total by that th third year out. So it, this is just me flagging. This is a, a um, anomaly, basically. It's, it's, it's something that's happening because of this dual protection. Don't expect this protection to be that worth $3.5 million, right? That, that That's not gonna happen. So I just wanna acknowledge that that should be used for one-time purposes. We will get into a whole lot of trouble if we use that as ongoing revenue. Um, and this is why we need that increase to the base. Uh, these, these mandated rates uh, from uh, CalSTRS, CalPERS, you can see the increase from uh, 21, 22. Um, they're basically $2 million combined. Uh, those were unfunded. So the increases to the base, now we can say to the state legislature, you're helping us. Yes, it's increased to the base. We would have loved not to have this, because it's mandated uh, pension obligations at the state level, but at least we have an increase to the base that we haven't had. This is what I was referring to um, a bit earlier. Over the last six years, yes, it's 859 um, student loss. But if you look at 100, and, uh, I'm sorry, 11,135 students, this is right before COVID, we were frozen in our average daily attendance. Our P2 funded ADA was 10,600 in these two years. Well, 10,600 turned out to be our enrollment number last year, 10,624. We were funded on average daily attendance, not enrollment, of 10,600. That's nearly 100% ADA. We will never, ever, ever have 100% ADA funded, ever. So we need to be really careful and, and bright-eyed when we look at these one-time adjustments because the last two years from 11,135 to 10,624, we dropped 500, uh, 11 students times almost 12,000 per student this year. That's over $6.1 million. Okay, so that's going to catch up to us and it will, three year moving average or not. Um, and this is the projection. So uh, we are projected, this is Decision Insights projection to fall below 9,700 over a 10 year period. This is why we have to be cautious. Hey, Trustee Nelson has a question. Um, could you go back to the impacts of the enacted budget? Two two slides back. Yes, you got it, Trustee Nelson. That there one. you go. So first of all, the ethnic, ethnic oh yes, ethnic uh, studies local support. Um, it's restricted for the planning. Planning, correct. And and does the like materials just for that yes. particular course? Is that is that enough or? What they're giving it's true. Well, true. <laughs> Dr. Pradia can address this a lot better okay. than I can. Thank you. 
So this is strictly for the planning for the course. And it does include if we find appropriate materials to purchase those materials. So right now we're working with Santa Clara County Office of Education and a consortium of other teachers um, and districts to see um, what is available and what is out there, what people have planned. Currently, they do not have a lot of published materials for the course. Now, ethnic studies um, will be integrated into our social studies curriculum. It already is with some of our new adopted, newly adopted materials at the middle school level. At the high school level, we must offer a course. So we are looking, um, we've had a committee working for the past year. They will continue to work this year. Really their focus is looking at materials that early adopting districts are using um, and talking to the publishers about what may be available. Um, we must implement a, um, ethnic studies course by fall of 2025. Um, so we are in the process of doing that now. As part of the planning, I know this is getting ahead of the process, but um, it's it's gonna have an impact maybe on electives. It's only a yes. one semester course. It I'm absolutely. Gonna, I'm gonna ask that this be tabled because we are in a budget and that's oh, okay. not on the agenda. Okay, all right. So all right. maybe on a Sunday memo or, or when it, in the future, when it, when it happens. Yes, when it, thank you. Okay, thanks. Absolutely. <laughs> Thank you, and I, thank you, Trustee Nelson. Uh, I realize I skipped over the largest number on the slide. <laughs> so the $13.6 million was uh, based on that $7.9 billion at statewide level. So of course it translates to 13.6 million for learning recovery. Uh, again, we have until 27, 28 to spend that um, in the arts and music. Uh, again, I, I don't have a clear end time for that, but we are definitely going to have at least three years to spend that, and that's shown on the multi-year projection that I'm about to show. And I believe the multi-year is next. So again, um, it, it's getting smaller because there's a lot more information in here. And, and so um, normally I would not have, you know, the, the, these additional rows to um, explain. And so uh, I'm sorry, but they are necessary at this given point. And so it makes a little spreadsheet smaller, but I also don't want to break it up into two slides. My pointer is not working, Margo, but um, oh well. It's frozen, it's cursed. I heard cursed, I think you're right. It's cursed, it doesn't like me. There we go. Um, so the key part, the LCFF base, that's a $10 million increase from the June number. So the June number was around 100 and 13 million and change. This is 123 million and change. Um, that's the piece that has the 3.5 uh, average daily attendance and the 6 million uh, ongoing tied to the increase of the 6.28% COLA. So that's there. And then I don't know where this is lagging today. Uh, the learning recovery block grant, it's restricted funding. So every other number, it's restricted funding. So it's a restricted general fund source. It's on the categorical program side, meaning that we can't use it for general purpose races or higher custodians, bus drivers. We can't do those things. It has to be arts music if it's funded out of arts and music or addressing the learning gaps caused by COVID if it's uh, using the learning recovery block grant. That's 13.6 million. Now, this is really important. That's why I wanted to have my pointer. Realize that I have a fund balance. I'm planning already to have a fund balance on the categorical programs because there's no way I foresee spending 13.6 million, uh, 6 million on arts and music in any one given year. There's just no way. So we have purposely built this multi-year projection so that it accounts for a fund balance in, in those programs. So I'm having a 13 million fund balance reduced to 6.6 .6 in the second year. Um, the pointer is working on my screen, but it's not displaying. I'm sorry. Uh, and then it's zero. There we go. In that last year. So essentially what I'm saying is all that one time funding is so significant and so high that I need to already project that whatever plan we have in place, that we're going to have a multi-year investment into those categories and spending it such that it takes two, three years to get there. So that's why you see that positive ending balance on the restricted categorical programs that you never had seen before. It's just an acknowledgement that it's, it's, it's a lot 
and we have to be mindful and strategic about those investments. Now, the fund balance you'll see um, accounts for the same um, set, as, set aside designations way at the bottom that we talked about um, for getting the reserve level down to 10% because of that proposition to uh, law. It has IT technology replacement, deferred maintenance, uh, safeguard against declining enrollment. That number you'll recognize is the same value for that one-time adjustment. So it's a perfect um, way to look at that safeguard to say, this is such a boost in temporary re revenues that if next Wednesday, for whatever reason, we get surprised with low kinders, with whatever, um, we are uh, prepared to weather the storm and not have to immediately go into a crisis. Uh, and then the board policy, this is something that if, if we don't have this number in here, then the board doesn't have the ability to mid-year increase the reserves from seven to 10. So that, uh, it was already in the, in the board resolution in June, but the values of course change until the books are closed, all these are estimates. So all these are estimates, but that gives the board an ability to have that fruitful conversation in September. Otherwise it, it's just really tough during an operational year to squeeze something like a $5 million uh, to get that reserve up to 10%. So that's why that has to be there, has to be there now. Uh, and then you see that I'm up to the, the maximum reserves. So as long as we have those, um, uh, set aside on the bottom. And I want to explain why the top two IT replacement and deferred maintenance increase because everything on the bottom there is one time. They're not up on the expenditure size where they compound and grow. So that 2.9 becomes 6.1. That means I added effectively $3.1 million to the 2.9. And then I add another four to the 2024. It doesn't mean that I have you know, eight between the first two years. Six is the total between the two years. 10 is the total over a three year period. That's the way you look at that. And then the last three, I mean, the last two categories, safeguard against and the board policy, that number stays constant because it's pulled out once, it's, it's there, it's not growing. That's the true nature of a reserve. You take it out, you save it and you put it away. It doesn't grow or um, uh, deplete if you don't use it or touch it, right? And it's one time. You can't fund ongoing increases or things that compound with one-time sources. It just depletes that way. So that's why those two on the bottom don't change. The others are changing because it's increasing. It's an acknowledgement that we're going to have about 3,000 plus Chromebooks due uh, in 23, 24, and then another 3,000 plus due in 24, 25. Um, and, you know, Marvel and I, we're happy to update you on our technology needs, as well as the deferred maintenance plan um, with the September unaudited actuals and the September budget, because there's some context uh, behind those huge numbers uh, that aren't so huge once you see the context and the need behind them. Alvaro? Yes. How would you respond to those who would argue that you should show that we have a 25% reserve I'm saying I'm showing it here. If uh, if you add up all the stuff in yellow here at the bottom, all those designations, um, we can say, look, the law, Prop 2, says I have to be at a max of 10%. So I have to uh, comply with the law. Um, I'm also complying with the law by saying that these things are important and is the reason why we can designate them as, as part of our fund balance. Um, I think it'd be misleading and almost confusing to show any number other than the 10 here, because then the law gets me in trouble. It says your reserve is whatever, 25. Well, my reserve is 10 because I'm complying with the law. You have a resolution by the governing board setting aside um, the purposes of those. Um, and so I'm complying with the law. And many of those funds are one time. Exactly. And if we don't set aside, um, let's just pick on deferred maintenance. Deferred maintenance funds, uh, the state funds deferred maintenance for our entire district, $332,000 annually. Annually. That's it. Our community has supported Gilroy Unified, has given us a generous uh, votes on Measure P, Measure E, 
And that's the reason why you see Brownell being modernized and reconstructed, South Valley being completely rebuilt. It's because of those um, uh, general election bonds that the taxpayers, Gilroy, uh, voted for. It's not because the state is funding the 90 million at South Valley, 70 million at Brownell. So we have to set aside a chunk for deferred maintenance because $332,000 annually is all we get from the state. And we just spent two million on the roofs at on Gilroy. The roofs at Gilroy High, just Gilroy our, alone, and we had deferred that for too long. Three years to get to that yes. balance. Yes. Yes. Our deferred deferred maintenance needs have tripled over the last few years because we're not taking care of those needs. So it it would be it would not be acceptable uh, in our leadership roles to not bring to your attention that we need to start funding deferred maintenance at a much higher level. Yeah. The other point you just made is we know these comb books are going to go down and we know when, and we have to replace them over the next three years. So these are legitimate needs that the district's budget has to fund. Trustee Good, did you have a comment? Yeah, I was gonna say, uh, Mr. Mesa, would it also be inappropriate, even if we weren't limited to 10%, to include that in the reserve when the intent of those dollars was not for an emergency backup like the reserve, but in fact, deferred maintenance, IT technology, and so forth? Yes, correct. Even if we weren't restricted. That's, that's not the place it belongs. That, that's not where it belongs. Correct, Trustee Good. I completely agree. I couldn't agree with you more. Um, and the, the deferred maintenance piece, we have outstanding facilities in the district. We should all be proud of that. It's taken a long time. Thanks to Dr. Flores and the board for supporting the general obligation bonds. But there's still need. There's still age portables at many of our schools. We've got a long way to go. And we can fund our deferred maintenance needs on $332,000 a year. And we have an obligation to our employees and to our students to provide you know, good facilities and good repair. So it, it's quite frankly something that we're asked to certify, I think either quarterly or, or monthly, uh, Ms. Spearman would know, where we come to you with the Williams certification. And we can't do that if we don't have the funds to address our facility needs. Thank you. Okay, so that's the multi-year projection. I, this is just really information because it's so, um, the $6 million for the arts, music, and instructional block grant, it is completely separate from this initiative. And I wanted the voters of Gilroy to know that in November, they have an opportunity to support arts and music yet again, completely separate and on top of the block grant. The block grant is great, it's gonna be fantastic, but it's one time. This initiative will provide ongoing uh, revenues specifically for arts and music K-12. And that, that's already on the ballot. It's an initiative. So it's completely separate from that. And I just wanted them to know uh, that this is an opportunity to support K-12 education. Um, yes, Trustee Pace. That initiative, is it on top of Prop 98 or is it reallocating it's, it's, Prop 98? It's completely separate from Prop 98. Thank you. So it's on top of. Thank you, Trustee Pace. And that's why it's so important because voters will approve it. Uh, well, I'm sorry, voters hopefully will <laughs> support it. And it's on top of Prop 98. And the, the, why it's so important is because it's not gonna take away from something else, from the base or something that's needed from Prop 98. But that's just an initiative. Um, the next steps, um, it is not here, but I, I spoke about it already. We are monitoring the economy and the economic signals very, very closely. Uh, technical recession is already here. Um, whether or not that leads to another um, contraction in, in the third quarter, who knows? Nobody knows. But what is troublesome is that inverted yield curve I spoke about. What is troublesome is that the inflationary pressures still are looking for the Federal Reserve to continue to increase rates, what's happening in the housing market, the ripples that creates, et cetera. And why we care is because the legislative analyst office, which is again, an independent body, has essentially offered a critique, a serious critique, to the Department of Finance that works for the governor and puts the governor's budget together, saying, we think there's a probability, a 70% chance that you are off by $5 billion. I mean, that's, that's, that's bad. 
so so even though uh, we have you know a really positive i don't want to diminish the, the positiveness of this report we have a very positive um report you know good budget right now it is the issue of is it sustainable that we're all focused on i think even governor brown said those exact words is it sustainable um because all these flags are telling us um something's something to be cautious of essentially so we don't know if the sand still you know shaking underneath our feet or whatever but we just want to be prepared for it um in september or on september 22nd we will bring you the closing of the books for last year and again we'll revise the budget that you just see because it's a constant moving target we'll revise it again and then we'll have a discussion uh about the reserves whether it's seven or ten percent um uh, uh, at that board meeting and then naturally by first interim we will bring you the the first interim financial report trustees any questions comments yes, michelle quick question so the um the board policy if moved to 10 percent one time that's five five uh, million the, uh, i mean give or take it'll, it'll change with the closing of the books but give or take that that's what it will probably be okay that, but that's only if the board approves moving to 10 percent that that's correct and that, again that's one time it's a one-time savings and then you have a one-time influx of funds um so you don't increase or i would say it, this is the prudent time to look at those policies when we do have an influx of an adjustment that double dips on all harmless for instance to the tune of 3.5 million dollars um, when we have an influx of one-time cash um, and while so many economic indicators are saying something's coming up, um, I don't want to revisit those um, cuts that happened mid years, um, a decade ago or longer than that. It, they were painful. And now what changed was so many of, of what we were able to do during the last recession, we can't do. Um, Mid-year cuts are now really tough to, to shed labor. Um, uh, I don't want to say anything more than that because everything's protected now, and 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 so there's there's really we're handicapped to a certain extent in the way that we weren't in the last recession. So we got to look at those things. Mid-year cuts are going to be extraordinarily tough to, to 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 get by now, and so the reserves are one way to insulate the board from a crisis. Any other questions or comments? This is an action item. Move approval. Shell second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Mesa. 6C, first reading of recommended instruction materials for high school culinary curriculum and culinary program and textbook adoption. This is an information item. Dr. Padilla. Good evening, Board President Paseno, um, trustees and superintendent. I am here to um, inform you about culinary arts, um, our new program, and a potential adoption of a textbook. So the culinary arts program, we actually have um, what used to be called foods. We now have um, a pathway with culinary arts and culinary two. Um, we are recommending um, upgrading our current textbooks to the Pro Start program um, with foundations level one and two. We're recommending this because this curriculum um, provides really the, um, what the students need to go from our program in culinary culinary arts and be prepared for working in the food service industry. It is, as you see, more than just a textbook. So it does allow students, it um, basically is there are online tools that help them with scholarships to um, culinary academies, um, getting and connected with mentors within the industry, whether it's virtual or in-person, um, job readiness. It also helps them with their certification to work. Um, anyone um, working in the food service industry must um, pass a certification um, regarding food handling, um, it assists them with that as well so that they are prepared to walk right into a career. 
So this also provides a lot of resources for the teacher um, so the teachers can better differentiate based on the needs of the students. So Culinary One students have a wide range of experiences working around food and in a kitchen. Um, so this allows them to differentiate based on some of the safety tests and other things that they have available to them to really see the level um, of experience of the students. Um, also, they've noted in here undated PowerPoints that does become an issue um, as our curriculum gets older um, when there are dates on there, students will simply look at the date and decide whether or not it's relevant to them. So, so that is actually an important feature for us. Um, it does provide student activity guides um, with different types of assignments, again, based on their skill level and their need. Um, and it also allows them to do some virtual labs um, within the kitchen. Um, obviously, we can't do all labs that would be necessary for culinary arts, um, just because it is a year-long course, um, not a three-year culinary program at a college. So, um, so this allows them to actually differentiate those labs and help students if they have any specialties that they would like to pursue. So with the adoption process, we have a very small team because we have one culinary arts teacher. So we have a small team reviewing this, um, but we do work um, with Mission College and we do want to have an articulation program where our students can go directly from our program into the Mission College program. So our culinary arts teacher did work with um, Mission Valley College um, to choose the best curriculum possible. The cost is approximately $6,250 um, for the entire package, and this would be paid for out of our CTE incentive grants. That is it. Do you have any questions for me? I do have a question. In the mm -hmm. past, when we're looking at instructional materials, we get copies of them to look at? You do get copies. I am working on actually getting you the link. So we don't have the hard copies yet here okay. with us. We have the link to the online. Um, so I'm working with Mr. Camacho Light to get you guys, you will get an email with the link okay. to the material. So you will see that that link will also be available um, in the front office for other people that would like to review that material. So we're working with the company. Obviously they don't wanna give the link for their full curriculum to everyone. So they're working on giving us a sample link basically. So Thanks. I should have that hopefully within the next day or two. Thank you. Any questions? And, and this will be coming back next um, at the next meeting for adoption. Okay. I mean, in lieu of, we could taste the food also. So yeah. <laughs> Do they have smell of vision or whatever? <laughs> Absolutely. I want to taste one from the advanced students. Yeah. The <laughs> we, just, we have a before and after sampler <laughs> plate for you. Yes. Okay. okay. Thank you. Okay. Now we have. 6D, Resolution 2223-4, Independent Study Course Offerings. And this is an action item, Dr. Padilla. Yes, thank you very much. This is an action item. Um, as you know, when we went into our new VLA program, which is Virtual Learning Academy or, or Gilroy Unified's Independent Study, um, we switched from um, the traditional independent study at the secondary level to a course-based independent study. Um, we did that for several reasons. One was the increase of students that we had during um, the pandemic who wanted independent study. Second, it was to provide a more rigorous program for our students where they receive the support from highly qualified teachers within their subject area. So now instead of having one independent study teacher at the high school level. They actually take six classes just like their peers do um, with teachers who are credentialed within that subject area. And they meet with those teachers and receive support from credentialed people. So because we have switched to that course-based model, Ed Code requires us to certify annually that the curriculum that we have adopted meets the same level of rigor that our curriculum within the 
brick and mortar school provides. So we have contracted with Edmentum, that is the parent company, and um, we have several different programs under that that we use um, for our programs. We use Calvert at the elementary school, um, we do use um, Edmentum at the secondary, and we also use Ed Options, um, which we tend to use for GECA because they offer the advanced and AP coursework um, through Ed Options. So we have reviewed all of that curriculum. Our teachers have reviewed that curriculum, and we um, we do um, recommend that we certify as a board the use of this curriculum for our independent study program. Thank you. Questions, comments, board members? Okay, hearing none, I will uh, entertain a motion for approval. Do I have a second? Ms. Michelle, second. Oh. Okay, this is a roll call vote. It is a resolution. Melissa Geary? Yes. Andrew Gideon? Yes. Yes. Mark Good? Yes. 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 Motion carries. Thank you. Thank you. Item 6E, approval of resolution 222302, speech and hearing therapy services waiver for the 2223 school year. Dr. Winslow, and this is an action item. Thank you, President Pisano, members of the board, Superintendent Flores. Item 6E is the approval of resolution 2223-02. Uh, school districts in the state of California who are hiring speech and language services have the opportunity to either hire somebody with a credential or um, apply for a waiver under Ed Code for those who actually have a license and a master's degree specifically in um, communication disorders and they're licensed through the Speech Language Pathology and Audiology Board. Um, and so with this resolution is to employ Geetha Krishnan who does meet those qualifications into our ranks to provide speech and language services to the district. Trustees, do you have any questions or comments? I will entertain a motion. Move approval. Melissa, I'll second. Okay, wake up, trustees. This is a <laughs> this is a roll call vote. You're playing chicken. I know you're playing chicken. This is a roll call vote. Sorry. Yes. 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 Motion carries. Thank you. Now we have 6F, increase in salary schedule for certificated substitute teachers. This also is an action item. Dr. Winslow. Thank you, President Piceno. Um, Going back in time during COVID, as we remember in 2019, 2020, uh, the school district requested that the board approve an emergency action for substitute teachers increasing the pay, uh, which was an incredible help during the COVID pandemic. The year after the pandemic, I guess the second year of the pandemic, the school district um, requested that the board and the board did approve two subsequent extensions of the substitute rate. Um, one was done in the autumn session or the fall and the other one was done um, after the uh, end of the 2021 school year um, to a new rate. As districts in the surrounding area were also struggling with the general labor market, uh, we needed to be competitive to remain uh, viable in terms of our labor pool for certificated substitutes. Um, like with everything, inflation and so forth has stuck. And so we are requesting that the board make permanent the last increase in substitute rates. In the packet, what I've done is I've included the proposed rates. And so just to, to publicly state, it would be $200 per day for a certificated substitute who's licensed through the state and 220 if they are serving in a special needs class. Um, and then we also did make adjustments in this proposal to the new start time for high school. So you'll see a couple of different changes um, to that and also a special call out to GECA, which has never had its own um, specific unique hours. So we did consult with Sonia Flores, the principal, to make sure that that worked for GECA as well. So there was some cleanup in the proposal as well as the main proposal, which is to make permanent the last increase from the board that was approved um, in uh, January, I believe, or December 
of last year. We've also provided in the PAC, just for your reference, the 2019 rates. And so those would be the pre-pandemic rates um, for your reference. We do know, and we do wanna thank the board for approving um, these extensions, as well as the increases in rates. Uh, I do not honestly know how we could have gotten through um, at the old rates due to the comparative districts in the surrounding area. So it was an immense help. Um, and I know the, the increase in certificated substitutes have also been greatly appreciated by teachers as well. So we're requesting that this be approved by the board tonight. Tom, uh, Mr. Questions, trustees. Trustee Good? Yes, I see this as qualified uh, as substitute teachers with valid 30-day substitute permit or California teaching credential. Do we have any different type of substitutes other than those two categories? The only other substitutes we have would be classified substitutes, which would serve for uh, like custodial and secretarial. But the only one that's the only, the only substitute that's able to work in a classroom is this chart right here, and it has to be a certificate so substitute. So it's all substitute teachers, period. Uh, exactly. Yeah, one and the same. Certificated substitutes is a substitute teacher well, synonymous. But they're, but they're not always certificated, right? Yes. In the state of California, to be a substitute teacher, you must be certificated by the state of California. But it's different than our certificated full-time teachers, correct? Correct. It's a different certificate. Okay. Yeah. That, that's where the confusion I was having. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, so to become a substitute, you do have to apply with the state and you receive what's called a substitute permit. That's what makes them certificated. And so they can stand in place any, for anybody who needs an actual credential with the classroom teacher. Thank you. Trustee Nelson, did you, or, oh, Trustee Akiri, sorry. Me, because I, as a teacher, have had to dip into differential pay mm -hmm. to provide pay for that substitute. How is that going to work? I know we had this issue in the spring. Did that sunset? Correct. And so any, any resolution that the board takes tonight or acceptance of this, um, should it impact anything in a collective bargaining agreement, that will be subject to bargaining. So I, I can't go further into it okay. because it, it, it involves in the world of bargaining, and that would be something that we would have to deal after any resolution. Can I ask this? Would this hurt teachers that will go into differential pay in the fall? The current collective bargaining agreement differential pay is based on the existing sub rate, so there could be there would definitely be an impact as that's what's referenced in the bargaining agreement. And as you referenced, the board looked at that last time, and that's something that we would have to wait for the Teachers Association to ask us to look at within the framework of bargaining. Got it. Thank you. I have a question that's unfair. Maybe you know it off the top of your head. I studied numbers before this presentation, hoping I can. <laughs> How, well. <laughs> Trustee Aguirre brings up an interesting point. How many certificated staff go into differential pay in, on average in a school year? Uh, not, not too many. Differential pay is really only reserved for extended medical. So somebody who's ex completely exhausted their sick leave bank uh, and they're going into the extended medical period. Um, that doesn't happen, happen often. Um, and then also those who have babies which is fantastic, right? As Alvaro talked about enrollment, um, those who go into the baby bonding um, mode, then that's that's what it would qualify for. So I don't know an talking? exact number of babies each year, but if I had to give a number, maybe 20 to 25 uh, a year would be impacted by differential. Right. Out of a, out of a group of 550. Right. So less than 10%. 5% yeah. or so. Yeah, yeah, roughly, I would say 5 to 6%. Okay, thank you. Any other questions, trustees? All right. <laughs> Don't just look at me. No, no, I'm, 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 would you, somebody like to make I just a motion? Did. I just did. <laughs> Go for it. I'm, I know. Right? It's 825, but it's our first meeting back. Right. Okay, do I have a motion? For, I just I just did. Okay. Not Melissa, Michelle. Yeah. Oh, I just did somebody over there. I did. Okay. <laughs> okay, so we have a motion to second. <laughs> oh, okay. Trustee, right. Trustee Good. Now we can't decide who's second. Okay, <laughs> all those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. All right.
Get it together, Linda. All right, 6G, variable term waiver. You're going to be up there for a while, Dr. Winslow. Variable term waiver request. And I can't, Abinov, Joseph, Christopher High School Physics, and subsequent BSR waiver. This is an action item. Correct. And if it's acceptable, uh, President Piceno, I'll actually go through items G, H, I, and J. They're very similar. And yes, so, thank you very much. Um, just to speed things up. So 6G is a variable term waiver request for Abinov Joseph. Uh, he's actually a second year physics teacher. So this is the second year that we're proposing to continue his waiver. Um, Mr. Joseph has um, successfully completed all of the checkpoints that are needed to continue to go towards receiving a full credential. So we're proud of him for doing that, you know, learning the, the craft of teaching at the same time as becoming credentialed. So the district's requesting that this be approved. This is for the credential and what's called the BSR, um, the BSR requirement. 6H is called a provisional internship permit. This is for Olga Hernandez who's going to be teaching seventh grade math at Brownell. As we know, in the state of California, math teachers are hard to find. So a lot of times we look for those who have math backgrounds or are interested in learning the profession. So Olga falls into that, uh, into that category. And so we're recommending that the board approve this provisional internship permit request for Olga Hernandez. 6I is a provisional permit, internship permit for Elma Ellenberg who is in her second year providing the arts education support in our elementary program, doing a great job. And so we're requesting as she's moving toward um, getting into a credentialing program that we give her that second year uh, so she can start to work on her credential. And 6J is Tanya Beretta from Elliott Elementary who will be teaching kindergarten. Um, Tanya is actually uh, kind of a homegrown potential educator that the principal of Elliott um, really wants to uh, to groom into the profession. She's actually worked in some of our support programs already. So we're very well aware that Tanya is going to be a fantastic teacher. And so we're requesting a provisional internship permit for her as she's already starting to enroll into a credentialing program. And so those four items are all very similar. And, and then um, if you'd like to take separate action or an action with all of them or we're willing First, to do. do we have any questions, trustees? Yes, Trustee yeah. Gary. Just for a clarification, mm -hmm. um, how many years can you be an intern for? Um, it's it's complicated because an intern is somebody who's actually has an intern credential. So these are pre-interns. These are these four um, actually are before the intern. Technically, in a statute, you can have an intern credential for two years. So is this an emergency credential? Correct. Yeah, this is before the internship. So there's several levels before. We have PIPs, STIPs, and waivers. So there's three different types. And you can have all of them before you get into your internship. Got it. Thank you. Other questions, comments? Okay, I'll entertain a motion to approve items 6G through J. So moved. Michelle, second. Thank you. All of uh, <laughs> all in favor. Blah, 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 blah. All in favor, say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries for item 6G through J. Thank you. Thank you. And welcome back. <laughs> we'll get there. Okay, 6K, renewal master contract with Beacon School for 2022-23 school year, not to exceed $56,385. This is an action item. Ms. Polito. Uh, good evening, President Pacino, trustees, and Dr. Flores. I'm here to present or renew a contract for a student who is placed um, in a non-public school program, Exi existing student. Questions, comments, trustees? Okay, I'll entertain a motion to approve. This Move is approval. Melissa. This is Melissa, I'll second. Okay, we have a first and second. All right. Um, all those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion carries. 6L, renewal of master contract with Achieve Kids for the 2022-23 school year, not to exceed $125,335. Action item is Polito. Thank you, uh, President Pacino. So I'm here again to bring a, a contract for the board for an existing student in a non-public school placement. Questions, trustees, comments? I'll entertain a motion. Move to approve. Second. Thank you. All in favor? Aye. Opposed? 
Motion carries. 6M renewal service agreement with Soliant Health LLC for the 22-23 school year not to exceed $225,432 action mm -hmm. item, Ms. Polito. Thank you. So we um, this contract is to fill vacancies for a uh, occupational therapist and a one full FTE and a part-time. So that's a one point one point something one FTE point, for um, yes one full time and then a point five part time point five occupational therapist yes okay questions comments trustees okay entertain a motion second, second. thank you did you get it um, Mark and Enrique got me one yeah twin and, twin and Enrique. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? <laughs> Opposed? <laughs> Motion carries. I thought you were going to say no <laughs> for a minute. Okay, item six in. Board bylaw 6158 revision action item, Dr. Padilla. Thank you, President Pizzano, trustees, Dr. Flores. Uh, this board item um, is coming to you mainly because you normally, as you know, have a first read and a second read. Um, unfortunately, with this one, we must have this approved prior to the start of school in order to offer independent study for our students. So this is um, the an independent study um, Regulation 6158, we have looked at some um, policies that have been implemented um, at other, um, other districts throughout the state. Um, CSBA has not yet come out with their sample. They're expecting to have that in September, but we've already started school by then. Um, so we have drafted this for you um, in order to begin our program. You'll see a couple of major differences for this from our old policy. So first I want to remind everyone that during COVID, during the pandemic, um, the state did approve basically opening up independent study for anyone that had health concerns. That is now gone. So we are back to the traditional independent study where we can have an application process and we can accept students based on their ability to perform within the program. So we are recommending going back to that application process as, and accepting students um, based on their performance. Uh, the other big change for this is that now students must sign a contract for independent study prior to beginning any coursework. So the parent, the student, the administrator for independent study, as well as if a student has an IEP, the case manager for that student, all must sign the contract prior to the student starting. So if a student does not come in and they have been approved for um, VLA, then they are marked absent. And if they do not attend to sign that contract, they would be returned to the brick and mortar school because they are not attending their independent study. And that is a new requirement. Um, the other requirement is that, um, they, that they meet with their teachers for course-based, a minimum of two times per month. In the old independent study, they met with a teacher for one hour for each week and they turned in their work. In the course-based, they must meet with their teachers at least two times a month, and they have options of how they can do that. They can do that by telephone, they can do that um, through, we use Zoom, or they can bring students in in person. So we do synchronous lessons for our independent study. Our teachers will continue that. So they will meet with their students and through Zoom. Uh, however, they do have the option to have students come in in person if the student is falling behind and needs additional assistance. So we can require families to bring their students to the school site to meet with their course-based instructor. Those are the major changes. The only other change, which is a change from last year, but back to how it previously was, was students with an IEP. So we can accept students with an IEP if the setting is appropriate and we can offer them FAPE.
So if it is not an appropriate setting and we cannot offer them the services that they need, then we can deny that application. So those are the updates in a nutshell. Trustee Good. So I see that we originally adopted this policy in 2017 and in the policies before us, there are a few small sections that are highlighted in yellow. But my question is, how do we tell what's new and what's old? I'm trying to identify what changes are being made in, in this document. So I'm not sure, did I, I probably you, didn't redline it, I did I, Lucy? You just described the changes, but maybe we should call those out oh. in the document. Is that what you're asking? Well, yeah, typically when we have a policy and there's being changed, there's, mm -hmm. there's a redline document which identifies what's being deleted and what's what the new language is. And I don't see that here. I other think than the difference is we usually get changes in, in our board policies from CSBA, and this is coming from staff. That's because of the timing. Because of the timing, because we have to approve this tonight before the first day of school next Wednesday. Sorry. <laughs> you don't want to hear that answer. Nope. No, but, but you could still highlight the, the changes. Yeah, like, I, like I'm, just trying, I'm just trying to go through based on what Dr. Padilla just said. We could find those for you because she just highlighted those changes. Yeah, they're... There's some highlights on this document, but I don't know what they mean. What's the what's the what is their purpose, if any? Those were the areas that were updated, um, but I did not redline all of the old policy. That is correct. I am sorry. Do we expect CSBA to put something out, and we'll be adopting that in the next couple of months? They're supposed and that to will do kind it. of supersede. Yeah, they're supposed this. to do it in September. We so may, we'll yes, if they have recommendations of something that we might have missed or language that might be um, a little bit better that um, meets our needs. Yes, we would then bring that policy back. And you and your team or the staff would take the version we adopt tonight and the CSBA version and come up with something that makes sense. Correct. Okay. That would follow the same process as our typical yeah. board policy updates. Right. But, you know, just a couple of them in response to Mark's question, like under master agreement, what you were explaining about, they have to sign an agreement before mm -hmm. they can go into the program is outlined in that section. You talked about um, special education students that's mm -hmm. in here. You talked about the course-based independent study. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I don't, I don't see anything that I find objectionable in this agreement, but it's good to know what we're not doing as well as what we are doing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, which if you would be willing to approve this this evening, we could bring that back with the revisions next board meeting because we need this to get started. I mean, Start if they're just going to be highlighted, they could just be sent out, right? They don't have to be. Or we could send yeah. it to you in yeah. my Sunday report. Exactly. Yeah. Your preference. Yeah, that, that would be good enough Sunday for me. Report, good. Okay. Okay. Okay, I'll entertain a motion. So do we have to waive the second reading and, yes. and adopt this is yes. what the motion is? And so. just for your information, this is part of the trailer bill through the state. This was just approved in July, and we must have it done before we start school in August. Yeah. Thanks, Sacramento. Uh, so I move to waive second reading and adopt board bylaw 6158 revi revisions. For, for clarification, like I don't think we need to waive anything, right? Because it'll be the exact same text. So this is the same reading Here. that would be read again. You're approving this we're for approving now. We're, we're approving this. Making it happen. And that's that's it. We're just getting a highlighted section. Song. Usually we're getting we information have... after the fact. Exactly. So there is no waiving of second reading. Right? Well, uh, that part that part is not necessary. If we are normally required to do it, I am hereby calling this to waive that. Yeah, because usually we have a second reading and we will not have a second reading for this if we approve it tonight. This would be our first and only. So therefore, the second oh, reading is okay. waived. Okay. Does that make sense? Okay. Okay. So do I have a second? Thank you. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. Thank you. Thank you. And we have 6-0 board policies revisions. First reading, discussion item. Any? So this is our normal process. <laughs> 
we bring these to you four or five times a year from CSBA and you received uh, the document that highlighted the changes and why. And um, so we're recommending a, each of us in our individual departments have reviewed the board policies that apply to us. And if we felt there should be changes, they would be in here. But the ones I, I reviewed, for instance, the ones that relate to charter school um, were appropriate to be approved. But we want to give you our normal uh, two weeks to send in any questions, concerns before you approve them. And I'm just going through what's been attached on the um, on the agenda. I don't see any red line or highlights. Oh, yeah, there are. There are. are there? Yeah. yeah, there are. Oh, there they are. Yeah, just they found are. one. Page mm -hmm. 18. OK. This is what you were requesting for the prior board yeah, policy yeah. and yes. we'll do for you in the Sunday report. OK. Any questions or comments on um, first reading? OK, seeing none. That's done. Now, item seven, board member reports. Anybody? Okay. Item eight, upcoming and new referral agenda items. Do we have any? Hearing none. Number nine, announcements. The next regular meeting of the Board of Education will be held on Thursday, August 25th. Closed session will begin at 5.30, followed by the regular meeting at 7 p.m. Oh, the agenda will be available on the district's website by 5 p.m. on Friday, August 19th. Yes, Trustee Nelson. Thank you very much. Uh, we'll take a... Um, moment of silence for a former employee, former teacher, Margie Severson. Thank you, Trustee Nelson, for reminding me. Margie was a longtime elementary teacher in Gilroy Unified who uh, passed away a few days ago, and we'd like to take just a few seconds to um, honor her tonight. Thank you. And thank you, Marjorie Severson and her family. Okay, hearing nothing else, this meeting is adjourned.